This is what comes to mind when many people think of activism. While public demonstrations are important and necessary, there is a form of activism that is quieter, slower, and more private. It has appeal for those who are artistically inclined, introverted, sensitive, or physically unable to participate in traditional forms of activism. It's called craftivism. The term comes from combining the words craft and activism. Craft is an activity involving skill in making things with your hands. Activism is the activity of working to achieve social, cultural, or political change. Betsy Greer coined the term craftivism in 2003 and then later wrote this book about it. While there are different opinions on the definition of craftivism and what qualifies as craftivism, generally it describes any activity that incorporates the techniques of craft with the goals of activism. A person who practices craftivism is known as a craftivist. So what does craftivism look like? Here are 19 ways people have used their craft skills for political purposes. Carrie Reihart's Mosaics. In London, UK, street artist and craftivist Carrie Reihart uses the mediums of ceramics, screen printing, graphic design, and mosaics to create murals with provocative protest messages about systemic injustice. Crochet their names. In Cincinnati, Ohio in the United States in 2020, Jennifer Solt, along with her neighbors Scout and Jen Edwards, created this Crochet Their Names Black Lives Matter tribute in Jennifer's front yard. She used a free pattern by Grace Dobush, who explained she wanted to make something meaningful that would also allow her to meditate on the lives of unarmed black people killed by police. Hombres Tejedores. In Santiago, Chile, the Hombres Tejedores, which translates roughly to men who knit, defy traditional ideas of masculinity just by sitting and knitting together in public places. The mere sight of men engaging in a pastime traditionally associated with women is their activism. Their goal is to promote a society that is more tolerant and less macho through transforming the notion of what a man should be. In Chile, it's hard for a man to just sit on a bench and knit because they were taught that certain activities are reserved for women and men are supposed to engage in other pastimes. Hombres tejedores want to break free from the stereotypical roles society expects boys and men to fill. Mini protest banners. In London, UK, Sarah Corbett, author of How to Be a Craftivist, makes and teaches people how to create attractive mini cross-stitched banners about issues they care about. Then they hang them in relevant places. Sarah is an introvert and lifelong activist who was never comfortable with and was often drained by the loud, crowded, demonizing and confrontational aspects of some forms of activism. She considers her approach to be a respectful, kind, and gentle nudge that inspires and encourages people to think, question, and act. Making these protest banners small and eye-catching draws people to them and gives them the sense that they have chosen to engage with the thought-provoking message rather than it being forced upon them. NCAA Networks. In Boston, Massachusetts in the U.S., the Networks Initiative by New Craft Artists in Action, also playfully known as NCAA, creates vibrant basketball nets by hand for empty neighborhood hoops around the world using the mediums of knit, crochet, and macrame. This craftivist intervention calls attention to and beautifies neglected public spaces. Underwater Yarn Bombed Time Bomb. In Cancun, Mexico in 2014, 
Polish artist Oleg wanted to bring awareness to the deteriorating state of the world's oceans and promote the preservation of marine life. The Underwater Museum of Art has over 500 life-size underwater sculptures created by artist Jason Taylor. Unbeknownst to the museum or government authorities, Oleg scuba dived down to one of his sculptures entitled Time Bomb and wrapped it in crochet. Her hope was to raise awareness about the state of our oceans, which are like a ticking time bomb, and to create a sense of urgency to act now if we wish to save our seas. This type of craftivism is known as yarn bombing, also known as yarn storming and knit graffiti. Yarn bombing involves covering objects or structures with decorative knitted or crocheted material without permission. It was started by Magda Sayeg who said she just wanted to see something warm, fuzzy, and human-like on the ugly, cold, gray, steel facade that she looked at every day. Yarn bombing can be a way to reclaim urban spaces that are becoming more and more restricted by private corporations and government entities. It can bring joy, color, playfulness, and a sense of beautiful communal space into sterile urban environments, or convey a political message directly. Wool Against Weapons. In the UK, on Saturday, August 9th, 2014, the 69th anniversary of the bombing of Nagasaki, Japan, Wool Against Weapons activists spread a collaboratively knitted seven mile long pink peace scarf between the UK's two nuclear weapons factories in Aldermaston and Bergfield. They were protesting the replacement of the country's Trident nuclear weapons program. Afterward, they repurposed the long scarf into thousands of blankets for those in need in war zones and developing nations. Knit the Clit In San Francisco, California in the U.S., Knit the Clit was a collaborative project with Revel Art Collective that resulted in an enormous knitted vulva displayed on the street. They encouraged passersby to interact with it to celebrate the complexity of the human form and to explore varied reactions to it. Then they showcased photos of these interactions on their blog. Other craftivists like Sola Olulode on Flickr have knitted intact vulvas with the clitoris to protest the practice of female genital mutilation and the use of rape as a weapon of war. Sharing Ink in Melbourne, Australia, Seraphim Lothian, author of Guerrilla Kindness and Other Acts of Creative Resistance, created the Sharing Ink Project. She handmade 30 blank journals with handmade paper inside and hand screen printed material on the outside. Then she asked 30 different artists and writers to inscribe a lovely message on the front page of one of the journals so that each was unique. Finally, she left these journals in public places as gifts for strangers to find as a way to inject a small, magical moment in their day. For Seraphim, tiny, joyful, unexpected gifts in a consumer culture are subversive to capitalism, which assumes every object is a commodity for sale. Don't blow it. In London, UK in 2015, Sarah Corbett and the craftivist collective she founded created the Don't Blow It campaign. They presented the board members and other influential people at the retailer Marks & Spencer with personalized hand-embroidered handkerchiefs. These bespoke gifts urged these decision makers to pay their staff a living wage. The craftivists researched each gift recipient so that each handkerchief contained a quote from a change maker they admired. Sarah prefers to bestow upon power holders what she calls good surprises that foster ongoing relationships and conversations instead of the bad surprises they can receive in the form of a tax. This is an example of craftivism that was a strategic part of a larger successful campaign. Within a year, Marks & Spencer had made an announcement to raise worker pay 14.7%. Gandhi's Khadi Movement In India in the 1920s, Gandhi started spinning and wearing khadi, a natural fiber cloth from India, as part of a boycott of British textiles. The loincloth and shawl he wore were both made of khadi. Inspiring other Indians to make and wear this homespun and hand-woven cloth was part of a larger non-violent campaign to emancipate India from the British Empire that ultimately helped India to gain independence. 
The Counterfeit Crochet Project. In Oakland, California in the United States in 2006, Stephanie Sihuko launched the Counterfeit Crochet Project. She encouraged crocheters to find a photo of a designer handbag they wanted, use their crochet skills to recreate that item, and then wear it out in public. Her community made hand counterfeited designer bags, belts, and scarves from brands like Louis Vuitton, Burberry, Dior, Chanel, and Prada. Stephanie said it was her attempt to insert strange variants into the stream of commerce and consumption. She also wanted to challenge beliefs about fashion and craft with questions about who has the right to make money off of intellectual property and what is so bad about small-scale crafters copying designs of large fashion companies if they mass-produce these designs with cheap overseas labor. Arpilleras In Santiago, Chile in the 1970s and 80s, women started creating arpilleras to document and expose the atrocities Chileans were experiencing under the brutal dictatorship of Augusto Pinochet. During his reign, thousands of Chileans were abducted, tortured, disappeared, and killed. Arpilleras are three-dimensional tapestries made from stitching colorful scraps of cloth onto burlap. The fabric used on arpilleras was often from the clothing of missing loved ones. This arpillera shows women in 1979 who chained themselves to the front gate of the Congress building during a hunger strike with pictures of their missing loved ones pinned to their chests. The sign in the bottom left corner says truth and justice. These protesters were arrested, imprisoned, stripped naked, humiliated, and beaten. This arpillera shows people burying loved ones whose bodies had been dumped in front of their homes. The banner on the top says, look at me, we are missing. The banner on the bottom says, human bones. Some of these arpilleras were smuggled out of the country and used in testimonies in front of Amnesty International's Truth Commissions. This helped build international pressure that ultimately helped to bring down Pinochet. Do-it-yourself clothing and accessories. In Cortland Manor, New York in the U.S., after being bullied because people were not entirely clear about the gender of Reddit user Zonal, this knitter learned to embrace this trait with support from the two subreddits, Non-Binary and Non-Binary Talk. Now Zonal hand knits pride flag clothing like this non-binary gender identity flag sweater called NB. In addition to being a way to publicly express support for causes and ideas you're passionate about, Making clothing and accessories for yourself and loved ones from scratch can be an alternative to supporting and depending on corporate brands, sweatshops, and capitalism. Wearable protests can also come from altering existing clothing and accessories. This can serve as a conversation starter to connect with like-minded people or to have awareness-raising conversations with people with limited knowledge on an issue. Making your own unique creation out of purchased clothing that is generic and mass-produced makes the item unique to you and can show non-compliance with fashion dictates. Visible mending is a technique that involves keeping repairs obvious. Patching and darning old clothes and accessories is environmentally friendly and economical and shows the history of a garment. Wearing a unique item whose story only you know challenges fashion ideals that encourage conformity to trends. Mighty Ugly In Vancouver, BC, Canada, Kim Worker teaches people to intentionally make ugly dolls with her Mighty Ugly program. She says it's a way of making people less fearful of failure and freeing them from the pressure of perfection. Kim says when we celebrate the things that go wrong, we give ourselves license to keep trying, to keep learning, to do the work that leads us to find our voice and to allow ourselves to have fun no matter the outcome of our efforts. Government Free VJJ In the United States in 2012, to protest government regulation of women's bodies and the government making personal and moral decisions for women, Donna Drunkunis started the Government Free VJJ Project. She asked women to knit or crochet a uterus, then send it to their senator or congressional representative with a message like, if we knit you a uterus, will you stay out of ours? Madres de la Plaza de Mayo Headscarves 
In Buenos Aires, Argentina's La Plaza de Mayo in 1977, mothers began demonstrating to demand the return of their children who had been abducted by Argentina's military dictatorship. During this period, up to 30,000 Argentinians went missing. These protesting women are called the Madres de la Plaza de Mayo, which means the May Square Mothers. At their protests, they wore their kids' white cloth diapers as headscarves embroidered with the names and birth dates of their missing children. Their demand, aparición con vida, which means a live reappearance, was also often cross-stitched on their headscarves. Since gatherings of more than three people were banned, they pretended to just be on a stroll with a friend by linking arms in pairs, walking with their silent protest on their head and sometimes a photo of their child around their neck. They still meet every Thursday at the Plaza de Mayo to hold the government accountable for its human rights violations. Memorial Quilts In Antioch, California in the U.S. in 2017, Sarah Trail, founder of the Social Justice Sewing Academy, created this hand appliqued and embroidered Say Their Names quilt. She says her motivation was to ensure that the stories of these black women, men, and children whose lives were lost unjustly to police violence are remembered beyond the fleeting moment of a hashtag. The NAMES Project AIDS Memorial Quilt was started in 1987 to celebrate the lives of people who have died of AIDS-related causes and to combat discrimination surrounding AIDS. At that time, there often weren't funerals for people who died of AIDS because of the social stigma family members felt and the refusal by many funeral homes and cemeteries to handle the deceased's remains. So this AIDS quilt was often the only opportunity survivors had to remember and honor their loved one's lives. The AIDS Memorial Quilt is the largest piece of community folk art in the world and was the first continually growing monument created piecemeal by thousands of people. Knitting Nanas In Australia, the Knitting Nanas participate in knit-ins on mining or potential mining sites and in front of politicians and offending companies' offices to peacefully bring attention to the harm being done to the planet. They describe themselves as an international disorganization where people come together to ensure that our land, air, and water are preserved for our children and grandchildren. Some people think that it's only craftivism if what you create with your hands and what you do with that creation are part of a strategy and action to advance a social justice cause or bring about change with verifiable results. Others have a broader view that allows room for raising awareness, challenging norms, expressing political opinions, memorializing, practicing random acts of kindness, donating to charity, beautifying spaces, and developing your voice as a citizen. What do you think counts as craftivism?